Great, great. Good afternoon and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. And this afternoon we're going to be looking at H145, which is an act relating to amending the standards for law enforcement use of force, as well as going over uh, legislation that is now law that was passed uh, last session. And to uh, do a, a walkthrough and uh, give us some context is attorney Bryn Hare. Welcome, Bryn. So good afternoon committee. For the record, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council. Um, I believe that the way we're gonna start today, I think it makes most sense to start today by taking a review of um, S-119, which became Act 165 um, last session. And uh, the Section 1, a big chunk of that act, um, you will find in the bill that you're taking up today, H-145, um, the Standards for Law Enforcement Use of Force. So I'm going to go through that section in particular pretty carefully because um, much of it mirrors what you're going to see in H-145 um, with some a few exceptions. There are some changes made in, in H-145, which I'll point out as I go through um, Act 165, if that makes sense. So I'm assuming that everybody has Act 165, 2020's S-119 um, pulled up on your device so we can take a look at that together. <clears throat> Just pause for a second so everybody can pull that up. And while you're pulling it up, I'll just say that um, generally what the what Act 165 did was to create a statutory statewide standard for the law enforcement um, for law enforcement's use of force, including the use of deadly force. And this and many of you will, will remember this quite clearly, but um, just for the edification of the new members, um, these standards were largely modeled off of legislation that passed in California in 2019 and also crafted from um, different law enforcement use of force policies from around the country, including Seattle, um, Camden, New Jersey, Washington, DC, and also the Burlington and South Burlington police use of force policies. And broadly kind of uh, the important thing, takeaway just from the outset is that the standards provide that the use of force by law enforcement is lawful if it's objectively reasonable it's necessary and it's proportional. And the use of deadly force is lawful if it is necessary in defense of human life. So the, those are kind of the overarching parameters um, and now we'll get into the specifics of the standards. So section one, um, the, first, the first thing you'll see is um, a definition section. So I'm just pulling it up here on my own screen. Hold on a second. So the definition section um, sets out several definitions that are used throughout um, this section of law that puts these parameters on um, law enforcement use of force. So I'm gonna go through them pretty carefully because they come up over and over again in the language. So the first one is deadly force. So deadly force, definition of deadly force is any use of force that creates a substantial risk of causing death or serious bodily injury. Force is the physical coercion employed by law enforcement to compel a person's compliance with law enforcement's instructions. Imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury. Um, again, this language is used throughout the standards. So it means when, based on the totality of the circumstances, which is another phrase that we're going to get to that's defined, um, a reasonable officer in the same situation would believe that a person has the ability, opportunity, and apparent an apparent intent to immediately cause death or serious bodily injury to the officer or to another person. So that imminent threat is not merely a fear of future harm, no matter how great the fear and no matter how great the likelihood of harm, but it is um, a threat that from all appearances must be immediately addressed and confronted. So law enforcement officer, we, oh, should I? I'll pause here for a second. I'm just confused a little bit. Um, so what, when something is underlined, that's new language, right? 
Yes, and so just as a reminder, this is not H-145, this is Act 165. Is okay. No, I'm looking at H-145. Okay, yes. So we can take a pause here and I can talk about that. This is sort of a technical thing that, um, that I knew I would need to explain. So because um, H-145 amends law that has not yet gone into effect, the standards for law enforcement use of force that passed in 165 were scheduled to take effect in July of this year. So that law has not yet taken effect. So the way that we amend a law that hasn't yet taken effect is to repeal it and to um, reintroduce it with the changes that you want to make. So it looks like this is all new language in H-145, even though much of it is language that actually passed in Act 165. But at H-145, when we go through it, you're gonna see is gonna repeal what was done in, in Act 165 and reestablish it in 145. Okay, great, thank you. Sure. Okay, I'm gonna carry on. Um, the definition in subdivision five here on page two is prohibited restraint. And um, I'm just gonna note that this is one area that is, um, uh, this is a definition that's altered in H145. So the way it appears in Act 165 is that prohibited restraint means the use of any maneuver on a person that applies pressure to the neck, throat, windpipe, or carotid artery that may prevent or hinder breathing, reduce the intake of air, or impede the flow of blood or oxygen to the brain. This is a definition that is going to change in H145, and I'll talk about that when we get to that bill, if that makes sense. <clears throat> Next definition is totality of the circumstances. This is another definition that changes in H145. So under Act 165, it means the conduct and decisions of law enforcement leading up to the use of force and all facts known to the law enforcement officer at the time. Again, you're going to see some additional language there in H145. Um, but that completes the definition section. So I'm going to move on to um, the substance of the standards, starting with subdivision B, which governs the use of force. So this sets out the standard for lawful use of force and policing, describes the general policy in subdivision one here as um, that the use of force should be used judiciously with respect for every human, every person right to be free from excessive use of force. Subdivision two provides that any use of force by law enforcement <clears throat> to achieve any lawful law enforcement objective has to be objectively reasonable, necessary, and proportional to affect an arrest, to prevent, to prevent escape, or to overcome resistance of a person that the officer has a reasonable cause to believe has committed a crime or to achieve, achieve any other lawful law enforcement objective. So again, the, um, the key words here are objectively reasonable, necessary, and proportional. That's, um, those are the standards governing the use of force. Subdivision three, <clears throat> this provides that um, the decision by law enforcement to use force has to be evaluated carefully. Um, so there's some general language there. I'm gonna scroll down. So now I'm on page three, subdivision four. This provides um, specifically that the analysis of objective reasonableness has to consider whether the officer failed to use reasonable and feasible, feasible alternatives to the use of force. Subdivision five provides this, this is the subdivision that um, got a lot of attention in committee um, when, when you were working on the bill. Um, this imposes a, a duty on law enforcement when a law enforcement officer has knowledge that a subject's conduct is due to something outside of the subject's control, for example, a mental impairment or um, a medical condition or a language barrier, et cetera, um, the officer has to use that information in determining the amount of force that is appropriate to use on that subject, if any. Okay, I'm gonna move on to subdivision six. So this is language that really just affirms law, enforcement's, law enforcement officers' right to self-defense. They don't have a duty to retreat once they're engaged. Now I'm gonna move on to um, subsection C, 
Now we're moving into the standards for law enforcement use of deadly force. So C1 describes when deadly force is appropriate. Um, it provides that law enforcement is justified in using deadly force on another person only when the officer reasonably believes based on a totality of the circumstances, as we defined earlier, that the force is necessary to either defend against an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury to the officer or to another person, or to apprehend a fleeing person for any felony that threatened or resulted in death or serious bodily injury. If that officer reasonably believes that the person will cause death or serious bodily injury to another, unless the person's immediately apprehended. So again, I'll just re-emphasize that necessary is uh, the key word there. <clears throat> and then subdivision two give, puts some parameters around what necessary means, um, describes the word necessary as when in light of the particular circumstances, an objectively reasonable law enforcement officer would conclude that there was no reasonable alternative to the use of force that would prevent death or serious bodily injury either to the officer or to another person. Okay, um, subdivision three <clears throat> provides that law enforcement shall cease the use of deadly force as soon as the subject is under the officer's control, no longer poses imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury. Um, subdivision four provides law enforcement shall not use deadly force against a person based on the danger that that person poses to themselves. And subdivision five provides that law enforcement when feasible prior to the use of force shall make reasonable efforts to identify themselves as a law enforcement officer and warn the deadly force may be used. And lastly, law enforcement has a duty to intervene um, if the officer observes another officer using a prohibited restraint on a person. And prohibited restraint um, was defined in the early part of the bill, subsection A. Um, if you recall, that was defined earlier. And we're going to talk about that some more as we go through the rest of Act 165. But I'll pause here to see if there are questions before I move on. OK. OK, so I'm, I'm going to keep going then. <clears throat> so section two. This um, section amends the justifiable homicide statute um, and it makes several changes. It modernizes some language in subdivision one. It um, makes some changes that make the intent clearer in subdivision two. And then subdivision three, this is really the big um, change that's made. For those of you who haven't taken a look at this um, statute in a while, it provides, it under current law provides that um, in the case of a law enforcement officer who's lawfully called out to suppress riot or rebellion or to prevent or suppress invasion or to assist in serving legal process um, in suppressing opposition against the officer or in just and nece necessary discharge of their duty um, is, is relieved of liability if they kill or wound another person under those circumstances. So it's really extremely broad language, likely unconstitutional language in light of um, the Fourth Amendment um, of the United States Constitution that protects people against unlawful search and seizure. So um, quite, a, quite a big change that is made here in section two. Um, and so the amended language here provides that law enforcement are entitled to the defense of justifiable homicide if they kill or wound another person only if they're using force that's in compliance with certain standards that are set out in um, section one of this act, which is what we just went through. So only if um, that use of force is in compliance with the standards set out in section one for law enforcement use of force. And I can talk more about that. I'm not sure how deep you wanna go here, but um, maybe I'll keep moving if I don't see questions. Okay, I'm gonna keep going then. So I'm at the top of page six now for those who are following along. <clears throat> section three, um, this section repealed two sunsets that were imposed by S219, which was the other bill um, that passed last session um, uh, that sort of did set forth some police reform. Um, this, that bill was largely in the GovOps committee. I think this committee also took a look at it, but um, the, 
the crux of 219 was that it changed the unprofessional conduct chapter in Title 20. Um, and it also provided, um, it also set out the original version of law enforcement use of prohibited restraint, which is the new crime that um, prohibits law enforcement from using a prohibited restraint as it was defined in section one. Um, and also um, did a couple of other things. So anyway, what this repeals is the sunset on that new crime because S219 imposed a sunset on that crime. So it repeals the sunset on the new crime of law enforcement use of prohibited restraint. And it also repealed the sunset on the justifiable homicide statute, um, which this Act 165 amended in section two. So it's a, a little complicated. I don't know if you want all of those details or not, but I'll keep going. Lastly, section four, <clears throat> this directed uh, the Department of Public Safety and the Executive Director of Racial Equity to report to the standing committees in February of this year. So um, right about now um, on the process and the outcome of their work to develop a statewide um, uniform model use of force policy for law enforcement. Um, so I believe that you're getting that report tomorrow. And section 4A um, provides that the council, this is the council, um, the Criminal Justice Council, it um, adds some new language there that provides that the council can't offer or approve any training on the use of a prohibited restraint, except for training designed to identify and prevent the use of prohibited restraints. And then lastly, the effective dates. And um, I'll just point out that this Act 165 um, provides that the standards for law enforcement use of force and that changes to the justifiable homicide statute are both set to take effect in July of this year. Okay, so I'll wait for some any questions before I move on to H145. So just I, yeah, go real ahead. quickly, um, so for tomorrow, the, you know, we are hearing from the commissioner uh, in person, the individual who is working on the policy. I mean, I'll just note that the policy is not finalized, but, but I think that's understood up front because that is one of the, uh, I mean, that's understood right now that, that you know, they've been working on it, but, but there are some tweaks that they're going to be asking about, which we'll be getting into later. <clears throat> to, to help them uh, in finishing that policy, but they do have a draft. It's just not complete. So just, I wanted to flag that. Okay. Thank you. Committee members, do you want Bryn to go over any of that again? In terms of repeals and sunsets and effective dates or just anything? Um, will, will that automatically happen uh, doing a walkthrough on 145, some of it probably? Yeah, yes, some of it probably will be m more fleshed out about the effective dates and how things are getting repealed and enacted. Okay. Um, Kate, I saw your hand for a minute and now it's down. I just want to make sure. Question or... or... Um, yeah, no, I I will just I will just be really transparent and and hopefully <laughs> actually maybe you can tell me where maybe this is in the space. I think uh, I think I'm feeling a little lost in the language. There's a there's a lot of different parts, and so um, are we going to have an opportunity? Are we going to come? We're going to come back to this. I, I imagine. I think I just need to like sit with all of the different versions of things and and sort of get myself oriented, or or I'm open to feedback on the best way to to sort of understand what, what's changing here. Right, Bryn, do you have a? Well, one, one thing I, I would note is that in H145, we're going to go through the standards for law enforcement use of force again, because they are all there in H145. And I'm going to point out specifically where H145 differs from Act 165. So, I think that to, to focus on the underlining and the repeal and all that is not necessary. This is um, because that's just sort of technical in nature and I'll just draw everybody's attention to the places that are different 
between what you pass in Act 165 and what's happening in 145, if that's, if that's at all helpful. And I'm also happy to answer any questions, obviously. Great, that sounds like a good plan, thank you. Um, Tom. Yeah, I'm just wondering if it would be helpful to anybody if we had a side-by-side -side of, of the act compared to uh, this H145 with the changes. I don't think you're gonna need it because the changes as they are now, I mean, you may as you as you work on it, yep. but as they are right now, they are very distinct. There's three places where the, the standards for law enforcement use of force have changed between 165 and 145. So if you are working with a paper copy or if you have a word version of the document, I'd be happy to send this out to the committee too, just highlighting where the new language is. Nothing has been removed. It's only new language inserted. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, Ken. Good, <clears throat> just got answered, thank you. Okay. Uh, Tom, is your is your hand up from before or got hand? Or yeah, I was from before. Great. Okay. Um, Ken. So sorry. So um, did did I hear where this one forty five is already going to have? No, that's not what I said. Uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow we are hearing from the commissioner regarding the policy that we asked for them to report uh, back. And I was mentioning that that particular policy, it says in, in this uh, Act 165 that they shall provide the final, re, uh, final policy. And I was just noting for everybody so there's no surprise tomorrow that the, the policy is not final. It's a draft and there's, it's, a, it's a still to be worked on and, and various components of it. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Bryn. Okay. So before I start, um, just to acknowledging that there's there there this is a lot for especially for the new members of the committee and there are several moving parts. Um, I think I'll just start by by reminding everybody that um, one of the big pieces of the police reform that moved during the last session, like the summer and fall session, and also the last regular session was the prohibited restraint language. So that prohibited restraint language you see in three different places in the statutes. First, there's the new crime. It creates a new crime for um, a law enforcement officer to use a prohibited restraint on a person that results in serious bodily injury or death. It's also added to the unprofessional conduct chapter of Title 20. So it provides um, an avenue for law enforcement to be disciplined if they use a prohibited restraint. And lastly, it appears in the language that you just looked at, the standards for law enforcement use of force. So um, there are three different places where we talk about prohibited restraint and we define it. So one of the big things that H145 does is it amends that definition of what a prohibited restraint is in all three of those places. Um, that's a big thing that happens in H145. So H145 does that, amends the definition of prohibited restraint, and also makes a couple of other changes to the standards for law enforcement use of force. Um, I might suggest, and this is up to the committee obviously, that I share my screen so I can show you the highlighted portions of H145 standards of law enforcement use of force as they have changed um, from Act 165. Is that okay? Absolutely, yeah, okay. Thank, thank you. Oh, I am I think I need to be made a, a host in order to share, sorry. If Mike or Evan is able to do that easily, um, that would be great, but if not, I can just- You are. Oh, okay, let me try again. Now it works, thank you. Okay, oops. All right, can everybody see um, the bills introduced H145 on their screen? Is that what, is that what is appearing to everybody? Okay, good. Can, can um, you enlarge it just a little bit? Is it, can you? You're, you're trying my, uh, my skills. <laughs> I think you go up to, I'm trying to see where you go up to to make it bigger. 
I think it's view. Yeah, it's view. You're, it's up in the top line there. You can go to view and. Oh. Okay, hold on. I have to move it over here to. It's pretty kind of hard to, to see. Did that do, did that change it? No. Uh, but that's that's lower, like, right, lower right hand corner where it. Well, where there's a little 100% thing in the bottom yeah. right corner of the document. Yeah, that's where to go. Okay. <laughs> did that work? No, I, I wonder if it's, can you scroll? I wonder if we're not seeing what's happening right now. If you're oh. scrolling, we're not seeing it. So you need to. I wonder to, if you're seeing something else. No, we're seeing the bill as introduced, H145. Well, oh, something, yeah, there you go. You're all set. You're all set now. Okay, sorry. I have three screens and everybody knows. I <laughs> okay, I'm operating at my maximum capacity with technological capability here. Okay, is, is that bigger? Everyone can see that? Okay, great. <clears throat> okay, so section one, this is going to look very familiar. This is what you just reviewed um, in Act 165, Standards for Law Enforcement Use of Force. Definition section, everything that is not highlighted is exactly the same as what passed in um, Act 165. So definitions of deadly force and force are the same. Imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury is the same. Law enforcement officer is the same, but here's where we get to some changes. Um, the definition of prohibited restraint within the standards for law enforcement um, use of force is changed to mean that the use of um, to mean the use of any maneuver on a person that applies pressure that prevents or hinders breathing, reduces intake of air, or impedes the flow of blood or oxygen to the brain, um, or the use of any such maneuver with the intent to cause unconsciousness, serious bodily injury, or death. Um, so you may recall that um, in Act 165, the language was um, any uh, maneuver that applies pressure to the neck, throat, windpipe, or carotid artery that may prevent or hinder breathing, reduce intake of air, or impede the flow of blood or oxygen to the brain, period. So it didn't, um, it didn't include this last phrase or the use of such maneuver with the intent to cause unconsciousness, serious bodily injury, or death. So um, as you can see, the definition has um, is slightly more narrow than it was in um, Act 165. So that maneuver has to actually prevent or hinder breathing, actually reduce intake of air, or actually impede the flow of blood or oxygen to the brain. Or there's the alternative that that use of maneuver, if combined with the intent to cause unconsciousness, serious bodily injury or death, is a prohibited restraint. So um, we will return to this definition in this bill because we've changed it in two other places also, as I, as I mentioned at the outset. Uh, Tom and then Martin. Thank you. Brand, this is probably just going back over what you just said, but, but before it, these were may prevent or hinder breathing, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So could you could you explain where uh, where this language came from, Bryn? Yes. Yeah, so this um, yes, I can. So th there was um, well, why, will you ask me that question more specifically? Yeah, but well, let me. I'll ask it as a leading question. <laughs> <laughs> so, so is this language from what Massachusetts recently passed? Does it kind of follow or track what Massachusetts passed for use of force law? I think after we passed our, ours this past. Yes, yes, it does. Um, Massachusetts passed a pretty large police reform bill um, at the end of last year. And one of the things that they did was to prohibit these types of restraints. And they defined the restraints in this way um, with the inclusion of that intent element. So if, if the maneuver actually caused um, the hindered breathing, et cetera, or if the maneuver was um, done with the intent to cause uh, unconsciousness or, or injury. 
So just a follow-up question. Um, since, yeah, it's a, it's a good question for the legislative council. So, um, so in interpreting, in, if, if this case eventually comes before, if this is what we pass, and uh, eventually there's a challenge and this particular definition is challenged. Uh, isn't there a benefit that a larger state like Massachusetts, I'll ask this as a leading question as well, but is there a benefit uh, having a larger state that has this language because they may have interpreted it? Now I know it's not binding on, on the Vermont court, uh, but they could look at uh, how another state has interpreted the same language to as kind of a persuasive authority. If you could comment on that, maybe I'm wrong about that, but but that was my understanding as possibly one of the rationales for following the Massachusetts language. Certainly. So I think that um, Massachusetts may be a state that winds up litigating um, this law um, before Vermont does, just by nature of there being um, being a larger population. Um, having the big city of Boston, um, there, there may be litigation coming out of Massachusetts before there would be out of Vermont. So um, yes, uh, any court decision interpreting the meaning of these words or these definitions um, wouldn't necessarily be binding on a Vermont court, but it would provide some context um, for understanding of how a court may, uh, may interpret these, these definitions. Thanks. Um, so I'll, I'm going to keep going. <clears throat> the next definition, um, so this is the second place where you're going to see a change to Act 165, is the definition of totality of the circumstances. So in Act 165, this was defined as just um, the conduct and decisions of the law enforcement officer leading up to the use of force and all facts known to the law enforcement officer at the time. <clears throat> H-145 adds um, the person or persons involved and any bystanders, so the conduct of the subject and also of anyone else present at the scene um, are, should also be taken into account in considering the totality of the circumstances. And I think that this was really, um, I, I don't think that there was a, the committee intended to um, leave out those individuals. Um, this is really just a cleanup change. Right, thank you. And you, you muted yourself. Oh, yeah, 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 okay, thank you. Um, Camille, I just want you to know that, that this language was, um, came about in consultation with, uh, with DPS and you will be hearing from, um, from the commissioner tomorrow. And I don't, I don't know if Jennifer Morrison will be with us tomorrow or not, but we certainly will, will hear from her and she's, she's, very involved in, in this conversation. And so I um, have really appreciated their, um, their involvement and, and their thoughts on, on how, to, how to move this forward and, and get to a statewide policy. So just a little bit of, of background. Uh, Martin. Yeah, and I just wanted to give a little bit more background on this particular change because uh, the folks that were in the committee last year will remember that we did a lot of different things with trying to figure out totality of circumstances uh, we had uh, some prosecutors who s suggested kind of a long list of, of different uh, items or different issues or, or things that should be taken or taken into account as part of the totality of circumstances. And when we did that, we dropped, you know, the behavior of the subject essentially uh, down into that list. And, and then we decided not to have the list and we didn't put that back because it, when it was introduced, this bill, totality of the circumstance, or I should say when it came over from the Senate, very clearly uh, said the, uh, the conduct and decisions of uh, the law enforcement officer or the subject. And somewhere along the lines that of the subject kind of got, got lost. Um, so it's, it's really correcting that, although it is adding the bystanders and, and we'll have to hear testimony on why that should be added. It makes some sense, but but certainly folks will testify to that. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Tom. Yeah, that was going to be my question around the the bystanders. I mean, I can certainly understand the law enforcement officer, the person or persons involved, kind of be 
is, is the kind of the subject, but the bystanders has got me a little baffled. So I will be looking forward to hearing a little explanation of that. Jen had a good, uh, Jen Morrison did have a good explanation, but we'll let, let her explain it rather than getting it through me, so. Uh, Ken. So can I just ask a question without waiting for all the suspense? Is a bystander or another cop or something that's standing there watching us? That's not involved? It's somebody who's not involved would be my understanding. It could be just a pedestrian. It could be just, yeah, it's anybody else who's not the My long question was, could it, okay, so let me rephrase it because we're playing a lot of this uh, whatever. Can it be a law enforcement officer that's just standing there observing and not doing anything? I think that's a better question for law enforcement or, or do you have an answer to that, Bryn? Um, um, I would I would suspect that law enforcement would say that they aren't bystanders because they have described even their presence um, at a situation as, as a, a use of force of some kind. Um, so I don't think that a, a law enforcement officer could be considered a bystander. Um, but again, that may be a good question for, for law enforcement when they testify. Thank you. Okay, so I'll, I'm gonna keep going. I don't see any more questions. <clears throat> so I will move on to subsection B. This is the use of force section. Um, no changes made to, sub, to any of this subdivision two. This is where um, the standard provides that law enforcement may only use force objectively reasonable, necessary and proportional. Um, no changes there. First change, you um, actually, this is the last change now um, to the languages passed in Act 165 is in B4. So this is that um, section that sort of describes what uh, reasonableness is under these circumstances. So whether um, a decision of an officer to use force was objectively reasonable has to be evaluated from the perspective of a reasonable officer in the same situation based on the totality of the circumstances um, which is a definition that we've amended here without the benefit of hindsight. Um, so this language um, tracks very closely with the existing federal case law um, describing the standard for, um, for using force by law enforcement. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. Unless there are any questions. So that is the, that's the last change that's made to um, the standards for law enforcement use of force. I'm not sure if you wanted to go through it again or not. I thought maybe we should get to the rest of it just to make sure you have time, but I'm happy to go through it again if, you, if you'd like. Did you mean go through the changes again? No, those are, those are the only three changes that are made to the standards right. um, as they passed in Act 165. I was going to move on to the rest of the bill um, but I can, I don't have to, I can go through these standards again if, if the committee is there. Um, I see Ken has his hand up. So can, can you go into any more detail on the benefit of the hindsight there that is just up a little bit or? We'll... Sure. So this, um, before... We're going to wait on that. Sure. So this sub subdivision here is kind of just trying to put, put forth some parameters on what reasonableness looks like. So um, how is somebody who's um, reviewing law enforcement use of force determining whether or not that use of force was reasonable? Um, so that's, that's sort of the context of this sub subdivision B4. Um, so this adding the phrase without the benefit of hindsight um, really is, is providing that the situation has to be examined um, from the perspective of a reasonable officer in the same situation um, based on everything that the officer knew um, without um, the lens of hindsight. So without the benefit of like 2020 vision that one has after an event has already happened. Um, so I think it really emphasizes uh, the existing language, which is that this has to be any law enforcement officer use of force has to be examined um, 
just like the language says, from the perspective of a reasonable officer in the exact same situation, based on everything that the officer knew and the totality of the circumstances that existed at the time. So, so if I was a so if, sorry, if I was a lawyer, which everybody knows I'm not, and I'm looking right at this, the first thing I tear apart is somebody that says perspective of reasonable officer in the same situation. There isn't anything out there that's the same situation, is there? That really, really opens up a whole whatever somebody wants to interpolate what's going on, right? There's always going to be something different in a uh, in, in in force. But I I think that so this language really comes from existing um, Supreme Court case law that is that is sort of examining these law enforcement use of force cases. Um, and it's true that reasonableness, I think, is difficult to characterize, but this language really comes quite, um, quite closely, uh, is quite closely modeled after, um, after Supreme Court case law on these types of cases. So I think what it, I'm, maybe you're getting hung up on the same situation, um, that, that, that phrase, same situation, is that right? Um. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that. Yes, Brent. Yeah, because I think that um, the way I read this language is to say that um, somebody who's a reviewer of uh, of a case of law enforcement use of force, say it's um, the council or or somebody within the law, the department who's reviewing um, a law enforcement officer's use of force, is this is really guiding that reviewer to how should they conduct their analysis. And their analysis should be um, what was that officer's action reasonable from the perspective of a reasonable officer in the same situation. So putting a reasonable officer in that those same circumstances as they existed at the time, um, would that be a reasonable use of force? So today's probably not the day to ask this, but who's uh, who? Is it a committee that, that's going to make this decision on, on this officer that's involved in, uh, in the use of force? So you're talking about the reviewer, uh, uh, who is reviewing law enforcement action with respect to use of force? Yes. So that's, that'll be a great question for law enforcement to talk about when they come in because they, um, there are internal review processes that they are better equipped to describe to the committee. Um, but a court could also use these standards, a state court could use these standards um, if a person did bring suit um, uh, against an officer um, for having their rights violated. So there are a couple different ways that these standards could be used. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Okay. So I'm going to move on to the next section of the bill, unless um, I hear that you would like to go through these standards again. Again, I'll just say that nothing else about the standards has changed um, from the way that they passed in Act 165. So I'll move on to Section 2. <clears throat> this is um, the crime that I described earlier, the crime of law enforcement use of prohibited restraint. Um, so this appeared in S219. I can't remember the act number for that. Um, but the change made here is once again to the definition of prohibited restraint. So rather than providing that this, these are the types of restraints that may prevent or hinder breathing um, or reduce intake of air or impede the flow of blood or oxygen, um, it provides that they do prevent or hinder breathing, reduce the intake of air or impede the flow of blood or oxygen to the brain or um, using that maneuver with the intent to cause unconsciousness or injury. And we can take a look at this crime if you want, because there are new members of the committee who haven't seen it yet. <clears throat> so sub, 
subsection B here provides that law enforcement who's um, acting in their capacity as law enforcement who employs a prohibited restraint that causes serious bodily injury or death to the person um, that is prohibited conduct and um, subjects the officer to a term of imprisonment or a fine or both. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. Section three, um, this is just from section 2401 subdivision seven. This is from the unprofessional conduct chapter of title 20 uh, governing how um, law, enforcement, um, law enforcement conduct is governed um, internally. So changes the definition of prohibited restraint there as well. To the, to the same thing that you've seen a couple times now. And then lastly, section four, um, as I mentioned earlier, this makes changes to, um, to the effective dates of the justifiable homicide statute to line it up with the um, date that these new standards for law enforcement use of force will take effect. So if you, you can see in um, section six here, Section one, which is law enforcement standards for use of force takes effect on September 1st. So um, what section four does is it provides that, that just those changes to the justifiable homicide state statute will take effect at the same time, September 1st of this year. And then so section five here repeals um, the standards for law enforcement use of force as enacted in um, Act 165 because you are um, setting them out here anew in H145. I hope that's clear. I know it's a lot of technical aspects of this bill. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, Bob, go ahead. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> In looking at this, Bryn, uh, I guess my question is, there doesn't seem to be, or how, maybe I missed it, <clears throat> uh, in my earlier years, which was many years ago, I have seen this, this so-called uh, prohibitive act, AKA chokehold or whatever else. Never liked it, never attempted it. Uh, but in this bill here where there's a lot of changes being made, I think those are good, but I don't see any uh, out, shall we say, for an individual, more importantly, a law enforcement officer who is faced with uh, uh, the, the possibility of death. And, and his or her only option, uh, last minute option is say they got a, this prohibited act and, and, and they're, that's their only way of enforcing this because of them being attacked or whatever else. It seems to be pretty solid. It just says you can't use this act, period. So, um... The justifiable homicide statute would still apply to law enforcement. So um, we went through the justifiable homicide statute in um, Act 165. And I would just note that um, even with the changes to the justifiable homicide statute, um, it could still be used to justify law enforcement use of a prohibited restraint. Okay. So even though these chokeholds are prohibited as a restraining technique, um, they can still be used where deadly force is justified. And that, um, I would just note, is consistent with the standards as they've been set out in section one here. Okay. So if the officer needs to use that, mm. that type of force to prevent injury to him or herself or to um, another person, then they, they still have that right. Thank you. And I, in, in that situation, I'm sure anybody would use whatever means necessary at their disposal to save their own life. So thank you. Not seeing anybody else. Okay. Any other questions for Bryn? Okay. Not seeing any. Okay, keep going, Bryn. <laughs> so 
So I'm really at the, I'm at the end here. I went through um, the effective dates and that's really it for, for H145. Thank you. So, uh, Ken. So we're not taking up 145 tomorrow at all. We're just, uh, we're just going over the, um, what Commissioner Sherling is bringing forward um, over, over what's happened from 2020, right? We're taking, we're taking up 145 later on, correct? I think they're, I, I think they're related and I think it's important for us to know that about 145 because it's, it's, um, and, um, and S119 because they're, they're, they're all related and, and the report was part of um, 119 or act, uh, what was it, one, 165. So um, certainly we are gonna um, spend a lot of time, I would think on, on H145 in terms of um, testimony and, um, and hearing from others, but it, you know, it will come up tomorrow, I would, I would think. Um, so I, I assume uh, Bryn is gonna be here tomorrow? Actually, I don't, Bryn, you, are you, I don't think you're available tomorrow. Is that correct still? Um, I am, I'm scheduled to be somewhere else. I'm, I'll, I'm gonna try to join if I can. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, so uh, these changes in 145 uh, really have been suggested uh, by uh, DPS based on their work on the policy. As they were working on the policy, they felt that there were these few tweaks that would help them uh, put the policy forth uh, consistent with, with the standards and statutes. So they do just want to, you know, they, they do interrelate. You know, again, Jen Morrison, who will, I, I believe she's scheduled for tomorrow to talk about the policy, uh, is, is actually the person who initiated uh, wanting these uh, tweaks to, to the law. So. So yeah, they're, they're, they're very much uh, intermingled. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Tom and then Ken. Yeah, uh, I don't know who this was for, maybe Bryn, I guess. But as far as all the effective dates, are those the same as they were in 165 or did they change? No, that's a great question. I don't think I was very clear about that. Um, in 165, the standards were scheduled to take effect on July 1st of this year, and H145 bumps that date out to September 1st. Which was was that was that mainly around because DPS has been so busy with the with the COVID that they haven't had a lot of time to address uh, the Act 165. You know, I would let them answer that. I, it was a request that they be given a, a little bit more time to um, finalize the policy before the standards go into effect and for training and, and all of that. Yeah, the, the reason I ask is I do remember uh, the commissioner talking about, um, you know, all that he had going on with implementing the, the statewide COVID response. So I will try to remember to ask. Thank you. And I, yeah, and DPS has been doing quite a bit of work on this. I, um, and, and again, they will, um, they'll talk to us about it as well, at, you know, as well, but, um, yeah. So did everybody get the draft from, uh, from the uh, DPS? I thought that it has it been loaded on the website or was it just emailed to the house judiciary? Because that shows that, you know, it's the first draft It shows, uh, who all has commented on the first draft already. Uh, we should make sure that that's loaded up. I, I don't, I know I have it, but I don't remember if I received it without the rest of the committee receiving it. Right, I, yeah, I know I received, but yeah, no, definitely should be, should be on our uh, committee page. Yeah, I thought the whole committee had received it. Maybe not. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, Mike, if you could, um, if you could please make sure that, that it, it does get up on our committee page, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, okay, so committee, any, where are folks in terms of review? Going through it again. I, th I, I think it would be handy.
Did you see that paperwork you're just talking about? Yeah, I'm looking forward to see. Uh, I'll. If, if, I don't know if Mike, uh, do you know what we're talking about as far as it, it should have come from presumably either the commissioner or Jen Morrison? Came from the commissioner, I believe. Um, I, I can also try to find it and just email it to everybody. Uh, Kate, do you want to go ahead while? Um, sure, yeah. I just was curious if it would be possible to get, uh, when you were just going through the, the bill, Bryn, you had highlighted the areas that were different and the bill that is on our website doesn't have that those sections highlighted. I just wasn't sure, maybe Meg, if you could upload the highlighted version, just help to signify clearly what language has changed. I can I can send that to Mike so he can post it. Thank you. Great, thank you. I have the report and I'm posting it. Okay, good. <laughs> Not find it. Yeah, and again, the commissioner will be the uh, the commissioner will be discussing the report with us tomorrow. Uh, okay. Kate, sorry, <laughs> I'm trying to get my bearings a little bit. So. Uh, Martin sent me some information, I think, about S-119, and I will take a look at that, but um, just curious as we continue to talk about this, if we'll get, get continue to get a little more context about sort of where the, it sounds like there was a, a law that was enacted or a bill that was passed, and then there's, there's additional changes that have been made to a bill that has not yet been actually enacted. Is that what I'm understanding? It was like a, a law, <laughs> the bill was passed. It hasn't gone into effect. Changes have been made prior to it going into effect. Is that what I'm understanding? That's correct. So the standards, we bumped out the effective date in Act 165 to July 1st of this year to give everybody time to establish the policy and get the training. And um, because we're amending it before July 1st, it's um, as if we're recreating it from um, scratch. So, and, and we're also bumping out the deadline a little further to, to September 1st before the standards would take effect. So, go, yeah. Did I, did I answer your question? Thank you. I, yeah, no, that did. I didn't know, it seemed like Martin was gonna jump in. It did answer my question oh. and, I, and I guess I'm curious to get context at some point in this space or maybe outside of this space about sort of what transpired between the passage of the bill and then the specific changes that are happening. Like it sounds like clearly some things occurred in that time. I'm just trying to understand that a little bit more clearly. I was, is Representative Lalonde, are you, are you, do you want to jump? I'm no, happy to answer no. that, but I don't, I don't know if you would prefer to answer it. So, so ask that again, Kate, because my mind was uh, fix, fixing on another question. I was going to have a follow up from what you were saying. Um, so ask that again. Uh, with, the, with the permission of the very patient committee here, I will ask the question again. Okay. Um, so it's the, the a law was passed, it hasn't been enacted. And then within that time before an action, there, was a, there were decisions that were made that, that the language needed to be changed. I think I'm just, I'm trying to ground right. myself in the context of, of those changes. Yeah. So, so let me, let me, yeah. Uh, yeah so uh, DPS uh, hired a consultant, Jen Morrison, who is a, an ex police chief uh, to lead the um, effort at drafting the policy. You know, we've, we've always, there's, there's always actually been a tension as well last summer up to the time of uh, this bill being passed between what should be in a policy and what should be, in standards and statute. And in fact, the commissioner of DPS wanted it all in policy. We said, no, we want to establish these standards in, in uh, the statute and then have policy to effectuate them or operationalize them. 
So uh, Jen Morrison started working on, on the policy and as she was doing so, there were some areas that uh, she felt uh, should be tweaked, you know, should be modified in the statute, you know, once she'd gotten into the, the policy making. Uh, and, and that's what we're seeing. There, there are a couple other things that I'm sure she'll bring up tomorrow that she wanted changed uh, in, in the statute that we did not put into this draft um, uh, because we just didn't agree at all. I mean, these other ones that she's put forth definitely want to consider and, and, and think about. Uh, so that's kind of where we are. Um, my question for Bryn though was, so when we are presenting this eventually back on the floor, we're not just presenting these three amendments, are we? We're presenting the whole bill as, as you know, kind of almost like feeling like from scratch or? or... That's how it will appear in the calendar. But I mean, okay. it's not obviously up to the member who's reporting to decide how they want to report it. But I would suggest that you emphasize that um, the, the body passed um, most of this, I mean, depending on how it turns out, I don't know how, how it's going to look once right. or if it will pass, but, um, but I think it would be important to explain that even though it looks like all new language, it really is not. Yeah. And so, I would note that this, we do, you, you do this all the time for the okay, new members. Okay. All right. I'm Amend language that hasn't gone into effect. This is a, this is a frequently occurring provision. So. Right. Okay. I pre appreciate that. And I guess just up, up front, I, I, as somebody who reported the bill and really pushed for this bill last year, uh, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say this. I mean, it, 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 from what we were hearing, my view was fairly narrow on what we should change because we went through a lot last summer and a lot of testimony. And it's not like we're taking this bill and really redoing it. It's like we are tweaking it technical changes I'd almost call. Although the stuff with respect to the definition of prohibited restraint, I think is, is, is more substantial. And I think it's important as well. So, but that's just me. And that was me pontificating. I probably didn't need to do that right now, but I figured why not? Yeah, I think I, I do think that's helpful. Um, hmm. Right. Just kind of figure. I I was hoping that this would be illuminating and, and grounding and helpful, but oh, I'm not sure. And and maybe after maybe after tomorrow, when we hear from from DPS, it'll it'll all come together. Um, not sure. Uh, Mike, I see your hand is up. The report has been posted. I posted it last week. It's under reports. Great. Okay. okay. So, all right. Bring anything else on this that you think or? No, I don't think so. I'm sorry that it's uh, been a bit of a confusing walkthrough. I'm always available for, for questions if or any way that I can provide some extra clarity, I'd be glad to. Okay, yeah. great. All right, thank you. Uh, okay, so this is all we had scheduled for today. Uh, Barbara is up in, I say up because upstairs, so if, we were in the, if we were in the building, she'd be upstairs in appropriation. She's listening to the presentation of both the Defender Generals and the uh, state's attorney's uh, portion of the budgets, which are things that are within our jurisdiction. So, um, so she's going to be, um, she thinks she's going to be up there for the rest of the afternoon. And we see that Selena's not here. So I am going to recommend instead of taking a break that we, that we adjourn um, for the day. Uh, Kate, I can um, be available for you if you have any questions about your um, report. Actually, the committee also is as well. If you want to have any questions to the committee, I can. We can use this time for you. Uh, so I'll throw that out to you. Thanks. Um, yeah, I've had a, a lot of really gracious offers of support. Martin and I are going to connect as well. Um, trying to think. 
I guess I was, so just procedurally, it, the, the second reading, so like Tom did today, right? So you have the second reading and you sort of go through and, and potentially get interrogated in there. And then, and then they vote to sort of essentially send it on to a third reading. So then that's a, another date that would be next week or something along those lines. Is that right? Correct. And, um, and there still could be questions on, on third reading, but generally um, second reading is, you know, is the time for, for the questions. Um, yeah. I feel pretty, I feel pretty good. Certainly open to thoughts or questions if people have any concerns about it, but I, I I'm just going to get my thoughts straight and write them down and pass them, pass them around to some folks and kind of go from there. Okay, great. No, that sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? Um, okay, so four o'clock, we're going to do scheduling for next week. And, um, you know, looking at a um, continuation of, you know, on 87, uh, certainly um, 133 that we did this morning. We have a number of witnesses that we didn't get to. Uh, there's one new bill that I would look into um, in terms of restitution and victims compensation. Uh, um, Bob, you had asked about that. Um, I'm putting it under 87, but that's, you know, that'll be a general understanding of, of how, how those two programs work. Uh, and then um, be thinking about how to, how to do 145 in terms of testimony. So welcome people's thoughts on that. Uh, so I have to know. And uh, we'll have Barbara update us sometime next week about the budget. Um, see um, if there's any uh, testimony that she thinks that we need and also hear from, hopefully um, Ken will be working with her and anybody else who works with her. So we'll need to be uh, flexible to fit that in so we can make sure that we get our recommendations to, to appropriations. So, so do, you want, do you want my input now as far as uh, who, who we might have for 145 since you're scheduling a little later with uh, Tom and Coat? Uh, yeah, or why don't we, you know what, let's go offline and you know, you can give me a call or you can, or you can jump in at four o'clock for the. Uh, I think Kate yeah. and I might be meeting with Eric at four or, or, or do you, are you calling that off Kate? You know, I hadn't looked at the emails yet, so I'm not sure. But Martin, I think you 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 don't necessarily have to be present for that. Yeah, unless... okay. yeah. It's more of the yeah. It's more of the technical stuff. That, uh, but I'm happy to read the report later if you want me to. I'm happy to do that. Maxine, I'm wondering if we can go right into our uh, work on the agenda or not. And, and the reason I'm I'm asking is I have a five o'clock meeting also. Okay. And it would, it would just give me a little more break in between. Sure. So that's why I'm being selfish. <laughs> well, um, so let's check in first with Mike and.